he said to carry out the transformations that would make permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. facilities could get away with all the cuts, just the wealth of that one single person. And that's the sort of world in which we live. And to prevent us knowing and acting on those sorts of things, they have to throw dust in our eyes, like the fact that unemployment is the fault of the unemployed, that people on benefits are scroungers. Another interesting report last week about the reality of getting a job in Britain. The number of people on job seekers allowance compared to the vacancies in Britain, jobs that are actually available, the jobs they say that disabled people should get, that young people should get, that people over 50 have been on the goal for over two years ought to be able to get, or they will lose their benefits, or they'll have to work for their benefits. There are 6.2 people on job seekers allowance for every single vacancy in Britain. So there's the challenge for the unemployed to begin, but it's much worse than that in many places. If you go to Inverclyde in Glasgow, there's 32 people for every vacancy. If you go to West Derby in Liverpool, it's 33. If you go to Middlesbrough South, there are 40 people for every vacancy. If you go to Birmingham Hot Hill, it's 41 for every vacancy. Is it something just about up north? No, if you go to Camberwell and Peckham, it's 42 for every vacancy. 
You see, the Axbad, you've got another one there or two, Hull North, the figure is 84 job seekers for every vacancy in those places. Imagine what it's like to be a young person leaving this month from Blind Gal Comprehensive in the Romba or Driffield School in Hull, knowing that you're going into a job market where there are 84 people looking for every vacancy and you will be blamed for not getting a job at the end of it. What a disgrace it is that the Tories dare to claim that that's the reason why people don't have jobs. It's not difficult to see the feelings and the failings of capitalism in so many ways, across the globe and in Britain. You can see what they're going to try to do to make us pay for the crisis, to attack us, to tear up our services, to destroy a welfare state, and to divide us to stop us resisting it. But the reality is that what has really lifted Marxism this year is not just a recognition of what the ruling class's problems are and how bitterly they're going to assault us, but to recognise as well that the resistance has indeed come, that we are rising against them and we are going to continue to rise against them. <laughs> that we've heard of this Marxism from people in Spain and from Greece and from Tunisia and from Egypt and from other places where the resistance is happening. And the truth is, it is coming here too. It is coming here because what we have seen so far is just the first lappings of a mighty ocean, both of attacks from the other side and of the resistance that we have to organise in order to fight back and to defeat them. This is our moment. We've talked about it for a long time, we've prepared for it for a long time. Now the crucial struggles are coming. And Britain will not be immune. It will not be immune either from the scale of the assault or from the fact that there will be an explosion in response to it. And we have to make sure that the explosion goes in the direction of the left, that it goes in the direction of a worker's solution to the crisis, that it goes in the direction of the creation of socialist organisation and of revolution. That's the task that we set ourselves as we leave Marxism. And there are three immediate things for all of us. On the 3rd of September we will march in Tower Hamlets to stop the English Defence League. <laughs> We are not going to allow those people to come out and to divide us, to attack Muslims, to attack the left, to attack trade unionists, to, to, to attack gays and lesbians. We are not going to allow those racist and Islamophobes to march and we will dedicate ourselves to driving them from the streets on the 3rd of September in Tower of October we're going to the Tory party conference in Manchester and I don't know whether we can go under the slogan of the people demand the execution of the president <laughs> but certainly we will go with the determination to bring our anger and our fury against Cameron and Osborne and Pickles and all the rest of the millionaire crew at the top of the Tory party but above all the key link for us is pushing for mass coordinated strike action in the autumn. We've seen the tide of resistance growing in Britain. It began with the students at the end of last year. They played a critical role in raising the beginnings of resistance and showing it was possible to fight, it was possible to win, it was possible to push back against the coalition. And on the 26th of March, we saw the biggest ever trade union demonstration in British history. And on the 30th of June, 
We saw 750,000 on strike. We have to make sure there is now another date inscribed in the calendar of resistance in early October when we see not 750,000 on strike, but 4 million and driving for a general strike of every worker. A matter, a matter of rhetoric. It means every one of us going back and fighting in our communities, but particularly our union branches, to put the pressure inside the trade union movement to say to the trade union leaders, this time it has to be everyone together. And as far as possible, not just the public sector, but private sector workers as well, coming out together against the cuts in defence of pensions and to bring down this condemned government. And therefore we have a message. We want to hear the excellent words from Dave Prentice and Len McCluskey turned into reality. We want to see those trade union leaders to match what they have called for to see workers in Britain coming out as one. And we also have a message for Ed Miliband. If it's possible, if it's possible, for Egyptian tax collectors to recognise they should support these strikes, shouldn't the party that claims to stand for labour and workers' rights and takes 80% of its funding from the trade unions also support those strikes? be pushing for all the initiatives of Unite the Resistance inside our trade union branches to raise that mass coordinated strike action to push for a general strike and to ensure that if we get that sort of action, if we get the millions coming out together, that the message will not be thank you very much, very nice, wait three years to vote for Labour, but will be all out and stay out at the end of it. Yeah. Of, course, comrades, of course, comrades, the truth is we know. We know that the Labour Party has never been that sort of party. Regrettably, it's never supported strikes. It's regrettably never given a full support for the working class and its struggles against capitalism. And it falls to us across the globe to build revolutionary socialist alternatives to the social democratic parties which are failing across the world. Passov in Greece implementing the cuts, Brashoi in Spain pushed through the key levers of cuts. In Portugal the social democrats doing the same. And therefore we have to build those alternatives. We have to build a revolutionary socialist organisation which can take on the might of the ruling class. That can stop people who will stop at nothing. Look at the violence that they're visiting across the world. The United States now involved in visiting its military force on five countries simultaneously. The British government engaged in bloody and disgusting wars in Afghanistan and Libya. That's the reality of what they are prepared to do to defend their system. So we have to find a way to construct a working class which is powerful enough and at the centre of that we need revolutionary socialist organisation. We need a party that can agitate and organise for a mass strike in the autumn, that can give solidarity to the Palestinian people, that can act alongside women who refuse to be blamed when they are raped, that can take up the issues of education and of students and of workers and pensioners, that will stand against racism and Islamophobia, that will organise inside the working class so that the working class should use its power to create a world where people come first rather than profit. And that organisation cannot be hoped for. It cannot simply be left
to arise spontaneously or haphazardly. It requires to be built consistently, consciously and continuously. And we heard from Sané about the importance of socialist organisation in Egypt. The same thing is coming here. We have to be ready for it. We have to be pushing for it. We have to be at the centre of it. And that's why we have to make sure there is stronger socialist organisation inside everything that moves, the anti-cuts movement, the anti-racist movement, the workers' movement. We have to be at the centre of that. We have to be the ones who are seen clearly to push for those strikes in the autumn. And we leave Marxism clearer in our ideas, stronger in our socialism, more determined to fight. And we don't go back to Tahrir Square, but we will go back to Glasgow or Manchester or Birmingham or Cardiff or Norwich or Southampton or to the boroughs of London. And when we go back, we have to make sure that there are more of us in a united socialist organisation than there were when we came here. And therefore, I appeal to those of you who are not members of the Socialist Workers' Party to join us in pushing for resistance, in leading the fight back, in raising the struggle against the condemned, but also to be part of an organisation that will be central to all those struggles and will fight for a revolutionary socialist future. Thank you.